Welcome to Debating Russia here on Voice of Russia, our new political discussion program. I'm your moderator, Peter Lavelle. On this edition of the program, we have a look at events unfolding on the Korean Peninsula and the ongoing controversy surrounding Iran's real and or imagined nuclear ambitions, as well as Russia's relations with both countries. To discuss this and more, I'm joined in London with Christoph Bluth. He is a professor of international relations, University of Leeds. We also have Aidan Foster Carter. He is an honorary senior research fellow in sociology and modern Korea at Leeds. And we have also Andrei Batlitsky. He's project director at the Russian Center for Policy Studies. All right, gentlemen, I want to ask a really broad question to all of you because you, all of you have different expertise, but just how much of a threat is Iran in North Korea to the international system? Aiden, go ahead first. North Korea, I think it is mainly bluff. I don't mean to sound complacent in saying that because obviously no state should use the kind of foul language and stupid threats that North Korea has been using currently, and there is a risk that people will react or misunderstand. But basically, they are threatening to do stuff, most of which they can't do, and which they would be, uh, well, Bill Clinton long ago said it would be the end of their country if they ever did the half of it. So I'm not too worried about North Korea. Okay. Christoph, how about you? Yeah, I agree with that, except for the fact that the high degree of militarization means that uh, there could be miscalculation on various sides, and there could be inadvertent escalation. And this high concentration of military forces around the demilitarized zone makes this very dangerous situation indeed. But I agree that it's unlikely that there will be a war. Right. As far as Iran is concerned, Iran is in the process of uh, positioning itself uh, in its geopolitical position in the Middle East. And it's using both terrorism and it's using its nuclear program as a way of, of advancing its geopolitical positions. And that is a, a, a serious problem. Okay, those are very strong words, Andre. You kind of your heads, your eyes almost popped out of your head here. Uh, yeah, I, I just was a little bit surprised by the word terrorism. But at first, a small comment on North Korea: the whole militarization thing in uh, Asia and in the area surrounded in North Korea, which would mean that there would be more defense spending in Republic of Korea, probably in Japan. Um, more uh, so United States like an arms forces. Race, the arms race is what yes, you're and uh, it's not only uh, covering the Korean Peninsula; it is also have repercussions in China, in Japan, in Korea, and it makes the situation more tense, especially when we talk about this pivot on Asia uh, that United States proclaimed. So it's getting the whole regional relations a little bit more nervous and more problematic. Talking about Iran, there are a lot of problems uh, with Iran, of course, and uh, mainly they are connected to the uh, nuclear program, but I would not be uh, saying that there is any clear uh, linkage between Iran and terrorism. At least if... Um, well, there's certainly victims of terrorism. Aiden, if I can go back to you, when you look at the North Koreans, I mean, they're sending out a message. They want something. Because, in the again, if we look at the case of Iran and we look at North Korea, the United States would like to see regime change in both countries. That's quite threatening. Uh, I'm tempted to pick up on that last thing. The United States, Russia, you know, we, 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 we personalize, we reify countries like this. I do not think that the second Obama administration wants any more trouble anywhere in Asia. It's got its hands full in places further west. And as far as the North Korean antics go, I, I have been, for my sins, following North Korea for 40 years. I've been reading their rhetoric. They always shout, they always bluster, but they usually want something. But they, two things are different this time. They, they, they're shouting louder than ever, saying crazy things, and they're not actually saying what they want. So it's a new, I, I associate both these factors with the new leader, Kim Jong-un. So in that sense, we are in, uh, in slightly unknown territory. And although I do think they're bluffing, well, I'm a bit worried. Aiden, we do, we know one thing is that Ung wants a telephone call from Obama. Okay, we know that. Okay, how about why shouldn't Obama do that? Oh, come on. Um, <laughs> you know how you, I wish someone it's could a, say it's that a to telephone Mr. Call. Mr. Putin. Call. Just, just, and may, it may be that international, the norms of international diplomacy should be more fluid, but you know and I know that uh, when a, a clapped out and slightly sad basketball player who has had more time with Kim Jong un than, than anybody else comes back and says that, you can't just cut through a Gordian <laughs> knot. If he wants to call somebody, the South Koreans with astonishing patience, Park and here, their new president. 
president who offered trust politic and was greeted with all this nonsense is still talking about dialogue you know so they can the north koreans need to do the calling yes actually i mean the the south koreans signaled okay. quite strongly Could- they were willing to re-engage with north korea and the North Korea have basically rebuffed them quite severely so far. Andre, I mean, both countries have made it very clear that they would like to have security guarantees. Now, first of all, what does that mean, and is it all-inclusive? There are different tracks, first of all, when we talk about each of these potential conflicts. When we talk about North Korea, we have a format which includes the closest neighbors of uh, Korea. When we talk about Iran, we have the six, well, pr- pretty much the, the, the same format. We have six international mediators, which includes P5 and uh, Germany. And uh, again, if we're talking about Iranian nuclear program, we have taken into consideration that there is a Iranian nuclear program, but there's also clear uh, regional problems that Iran is having, for example, with Saudi Arabia, with its uh, closest neighbors. And we have to remember that, for example, during the Iraq-Iranian war, uh, when uh, Saddam Hussein was using chemical weapons, the weapons of mass destruction, no one from international community came to, to support Iran. So Iran still has this deeply embedded uh, thing that if, if something happens, it will be alone. Well, there was a, a forced regime change in well, 1953 as well. Well, uh, yes, and, and that, that also, and they have also d- deeply problematic history with its neighbors going to, for example, the occupation during the Second World War by Britain and uh, well, United uh, Soviet Union at that time. And when, when you talk about North Korea, it's primarily uh, about the South and North, and it, it's confrontation which still continues. So when in, in case of uh, Iran, it's a little bit broader context. In the case of North Korea, it's uh, pr- probably more connected to North East and United States um, relations. But yeah, it's like a main track, which is uh, sort of nuclear program, nuclear problems, and is a broader regional context, of course. Uh, Andre, what do you think the North Koreans want uh, outside of security guarantees, outside of a telephone call from Obama, and throw the Chinese element into it? The Chinese dimension is, I think, pretty interesting. <laughs> this morning I was looking at, in English, at the, some of the Chinese mm-hmm. websites like Xinhua and so forth, and I've never seen them, although they don't kind of come out and give North Korea a direct kicking, that will take a bit longer. Um, I've never seen the agenda looking as similar as, as if I were reading news reports on just about any 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 Western media. I don't know about Russian ones. I mean, they are, they are getting very fed up. Uh, China, of course, took a strategic decision for a five years ago without announcing it that uh, they would prop up North Korea even though they don't like it because there are worse prospects. The idea, both the process of a possible collapse and the result of a possible collapse, a sort of united Korea that Mm. may have US troops on their border, they don't want that. But that's you know, that equation can be Mm -hmm. reconsidered and if the North Koreans are going to go on being a damn nuisance by this, they were warned directly by President Xi, you know, no one country should be selfish, etc. The Chinese might reconsider that and then it would be curtains for North Korea. I hope Kim Jong-un I mean, his advisors are smart. I hope that he's listening to them. Uh, this situation is causing quite a bit of damage to China's reputation because the rest of the world believes that China does have influence on North Korea and they really don't want the situation to escalate in the Korean Peninsula. Okay, but Andre, maybe just a completely demilitarized Korean Peninsula. How would that work? Well, that, that's probably sort of option, but uh, in, in order to dem- <laughs> demilitarize the Korean Peninsula, probably... Well, you have well, to... Well, I mean, everyone's talking about different options, okay? Yeah, Let's well, talk about options. Well, you have to probably make it unified first, because when you have two hostile regimes on okay, both... Okay, well, unified, so who... Who, who by the, whom? Who, yes, right, exactly. Yes, exactly. And again, there is a big notion that no one in the region is really interested in unified Korea, nor Japan, nor China, because it's pretty much the same when we are remembering Margaret Thatcher uh, at the moment when she was not really uh, keen on unified Germany, because you'd have a huge Yeah, because the change. East German al- elites didn't do too well in that one, did they? Well, yes, uh, that, that's one point, but the second point is that you have the big uh, giant, uh, which will overshadow, uh, in our case, probably Japan and will... will going for the leadership in in the region. So, yeah, we can think about that, but if if the countries are really interested. Christoph, how do, how do the North Koreans back down without losing face? Well, this is the difficult part here, because uh, unlike Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un hasn't left himself a decent way out. So he's really trapped at the moment in the cycle of mm. escalation, and he either has to kind of tone it down and to an extent lose face, uh, he hasn't really if, uh, found a way of, of uh, stopping this cycle at the moment because the Americans have decided they're not going to take the bait. This time they're not going to pay up. 
So that's a difficult situation for them. Aidan, do you agree with that? I do. Uh, it, it, is quite, it is quite astonishing rhetoric that we've got. And I say, and not, not linked to a formal demand. We always assume, I think it's implicit in what Christophe said, that, that uh, they want uh, some sort of uh, goodies, aid or something like that. Uh, it, it could be on offer very easily from, from South Korea. Where, and what do we see? We see the one joint venture, the Kaesong Industrial Complex, which had survived five years of a rather hardline mm-hmm. president in South Korea. Uh, the North I think they got across. There's a, there's a little twist here, which I think needs to bear up. Uh, they they declare all this. They declare war for about the last month, and then people start saying, "Hang on, there is still the, there was still this case on his own going, and it seemed quite peaceful in Pyongyang and so." They say, "How dare you insult our dignity? We're going to withdraw our workers from this zone." So as of now, this zone, this one little tangible piece, you know, of cooperation, win-win, showing there is a better way, tangibly between uh-huh. the two Koreas. The North Koreans pull pull their troops out. So it's 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 even worse. I think the Kristoff says you know, they he raises the stakes every time and a crazy kind of poker player. I want to remind our listeners that you're listening to Debating Russia here on Voice of Russia. Andre, how much influence does the, Ru- do the Russians have with the North Koreans? Probably not too much, Peter, because, well, it is supposed that China has a big influence yes. over North Korea, but a- as we are seeing, each time China is really trying to use its influence, it fails as seen with the last nuclear test, when they were clearly saying, we don't want you to have any test, and then we see bang, and then the third one comes. So even if the country which is supplying the North Korea with its essential needs is that does not have an influence, what can we say about uh, Russia at, at this point? Well, of course, relations with among uh, between the Russian and North Korea are better than, for example, between the U.S. and the North Korea. They're not very it's deep, clear. I wouldn't say. Right. Yeah, we have a common border uh, okay. to start with, <laughs> yes, and um, that, that, that probably makes us <laughs> neighbors of some sort. But again, when we are talking about U.S. North Korea problems, we tend to forget that, for example, example, if a missile flies from North Korea and it falls down uh, by an accident, it normally would not hit the United States, it would hit Russia. Right. Uh, so we have some, it's a neighbor and uh, probably a neighbor we have a long history of relations with, but a troubling neighbor still. Aiden, what kind of relationship does North Korea and Iran have? Because I think that's really something that some people are looking at, sharing of technology. There certainly is a, I may have to pass some of that over to Christoph. probably, there certainly is that. I must admit, if, if, if the Iranians were sincere in their religious beliefs, I think it's extraordinary that they line up with this idolatrous, theolatrous regime, but it's amazing, anti-imperialism, that stale mm. old, th- you know, song that is beaten so often for bad causes as well as as, as well as good ones is is part of the ideology but there has been definitely cooperation uh, on on the, on the testing of rockets it is thought that the musadan missile that north korea may be about to test might have some version of it might have been tested in iran we know that from wikileaks that part missile parts were passing through china because the american embassy was crossed and asked the chinese to do something about it it is sometimes said that iranian scientists have been present at previous north korean rocket launches so they are they are merrily cooperating. Yes, there has been a lot of technical one. cooperation. The, uh, some of the North Korea, uh, Iranian missiles are really based on the North Korean Nodong missile. This other missile, I'm not sure about whether the Iranians really have it or not. But uh, there's been very close cooperation in missile technology. And the question is, what are missiles for? The Iranians know very well that missiles are not really suitable as tactical weapons. They really only are, because they're very inaccurate missiles from the uh, 1950s Soviet era. What they really are good for is for using weapons of mass destruction. So that raises the question about Iranians uh, uh, or nuclear or, programs. Or, or, or said differently, creating a deterrent as well. Well, quite, but they're saying that they're not doing that. So that, that's, that raises a big question about Iran. But um, Well, I mean, the, the thing is, is that there's so much commentary about Iran and North Korea as rogue states or crazy states. But, Andre, if I can ask you, I mean, there are still rational in self-defense, okay? I mean, this is a rational thing. The, the way it's expressed may be whimsical, even dangerous, but they are two countries that are fearful for their security. I mean, Iran is surrounded by the American military. Well, I would still draw probably a line between the two cases because uh, as for now, uh, Iran is not really having any, or, or really violated any of its international obligations. If you see what it's doing under the NPT, uh, we, we see that uh, IAEA has some problems with Iran. We see that there are some things that need clarifications. But basically, Iran has not 
neither developed nor tested nuclear weapons. What it's doing at the moment is still adding the NPT enrichment uranium till 1975. It's low enriched uranium still. So uh, in the Iranian's case, we see that there are some allegations and we see that there is a possibility of a breakout capability. So pretty much there is some problems, but it's not the threat or whatever you call it. Uh, if we get back to North Korea, it uh, went out of NPT, it's conducted nuclear tests, it's, uh, it possesses nuclear weapons, but it doesn't have right to possess them under the, well, uh, it's now even not a member of NPT. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, it, it wasn't allowed to do this. So there is a there is a difference between two. And uh, talking about self-defense, um, I wouldn't really say that having nuclear weapons is the best defense scenario, because North Korea, as it is, existed for a long time and really it didn't have nuclear weapons and it wasn't invaded neither by South Korea or by United States or whatever. Yeah, but that's after fighting a horrific war in the 1950s. Yes, exactly, but, uh, but it's still backed it. by China. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Well, yes, <laughs> that, that, that's fine, a good fine. point. Yeah. But what, what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, if you have, well, presumably Nuclear Korea has a number of nuclear devices for the moment. It doesn't have a nuclear weapons which you can right. mount on a missile or send somewhere or whatever. So basically having nuclear devices somewhere at a testing ground does not impede other countries of entering and uh, like waging a war on you. If, if it happens, it probably will be more reliant on ch Chinese help or some other sort of help, but not on its nuclear device that it has. Aiden, I think it's really quite interesting is that we, we have a country like North Korea, Korea that does have a nuclear device, okay, it's not deliverable right now, but when we look at Iran, and I know you're not an expert on Iran, but you know, there's no evidence, solid evidence that it, it's doing what the media and Western politicians say. But so we have one country that has a nuclear device, no one's going to take the bait, and then we have a country like Iran where there's no evidence they have this but they're surrounded and force is still on the table. I mean, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? I suppose so. I mean, there are, there are different ways of getting up the nose of the US and the international community. And I, if I were an Iranian, I think I would probably not want very much to be associated with North Korea. Just like for other purposes, when people are trying to classify what are the last two hardline communist regimes in the world. And then, of course, North Korea gets bracketed with Cuba. There could hardly be two more different countries. And even the aging Fidel <laughs> Castro, I see, yes, who, exactly. who knows a thing or two, as the economist but, said, about being a young person. <laughs> person waving nuclear <laughs> weapons, um, has come in and advised the North Koreans to, to, to behave. The, the North Koreans choose to be an outlaw. The phrase rogue state is is, is good for them. I think it's actual tactics. They, they have plenty of opportunity to come in from the cold if they wanted to, but they prefer to be outside and a threat to us. No. Well, the activities by the Iranians are clearly suspicious. <laughs> How much? Uh, insofar okay. as, I mean, the yes. Iranians have acquired okay. war, warhead designs. They have clearly uh, been involved in testing military applications. What they're trying to do is develop the, a capability... First up, the West dealt with the nuclear Soviet Union, sure. then the Chinese got the nuclear weapon, and we still dealt with them. Now India and Pakistan has it, and it hasn't been used. It's a deterrent. It's not actually an effective weapon. I agree. Okay? And, and not that I think that it would be a good idea to North Korea to have one, okay, because of some of the antics we've seen. But Christoph, I wanted to ask you, I mean, how much do you think is this is just Ung just telling everybody he's in charge? Is it just domestic consumption? Well, I would say the primary... Primarily, I mean. The, the primary threat to the North Korean regime is clearly internal, and what they're doing is they're using the external threat as a way mm -hmm. of legitimizing the suffering that they're inflicting on their own people and their own rule. And mm -hmm. so this creates a very peculiar situation that on the one hand, they think they need to engage with America sometimes in order to alleviate the economic plight. On the other hand, they need the American en enemy in order to mobilize the population on their behalf. And uh, so I would say, yes, the, the threat to North Korea is not really external. The United States has no intention, nuclear weapons or not, to use military force against North Korea. And uh, so it's a way of demonstrating that they are a great nation when the economy is in ruins. Can I add something to that? I mean, there's a real puzzle as to what's going on in Kim Jong-un's Please head. jump in. Because he seems to think he can have his cake and eat it. There's this phrase, guns or butter, which is sort of a cliche from, from elementary economics textbooks mm -hmm. about the choices all governments have to make. Uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un seems to think he can have both. He has appointed uh, a reformist prime minister, Park pong ju who was a former premier um, during the last period of partial reforms. Uh, he's avowed, there is an avowed new Kim Jong-un line, which is both nuclear weapons and economic 
economic development. The North Korean press is full of stuff about economic development, though they don't mention words like market and reform. No, no, no perestroika here, much less glasnost. But how can he? Doesn't doesn't he get that? You know, a the money. <laughs> where do I start? The the money spent on one is not spent on the other. B UN sanctions. You know, we've also foreign investors, Kempinski Hotels, who were supposedly going to take over that wonderful Orwellian monsterpiece, the Ryugyong Hotel. 105 stories have pulled out. You're not going to invest. You know, they, they, they say they want foreign investment. Uh, what is he no. thinking? Andre, what is he thinking? <laughs> oh, <laughs> if I knew that, I would probably not, not be sitting here <laughs> somewhere in the uh, Kremlin. But uh, really, he's dealing a lot of problems for the region and for its allies and for, like, all of the international community, even if we disregard the threats of uh, missile tests or nuclear tests. Uh, while there is escalation of this sort, the United States would be going in for creating an anti-missile ballistic defense in the region. So Russia at the moment has a pretty much big problem with the anti-ballistic missile system in Europe. and it would be no different in the Pacific. <laughs> and then you have another one in the Pacific, which would also include China's uh, getting really worried about that. So I guess it's in no one's interest that this will continue and uh, go on and on and on, if it's just a period of time while... Aiden, jump in, please do. Yes, yeah, slightly tongue-in-cheek. I mean, for, for all conspiracy theorists out here, it reminds me, I mean, in a way, you could almost think Kim Jong-un is doing the Americans' work for them. And I don't mean this, I'm being ironic. But just like back in 1998, <laughs> the very first time the North Koreans fired a missile without telling anyone, really scared everybody, went over Japan. It seriously changed the whole security debate in Japan. Japan. And it was just when missile defense was beginning yes, to be an exactly. issue. There'd been a congressional report. Rumsfeld had done stuff. Very interesting timing. My tongue is in my cheek. <laughs> it, it's now creating a desire for nuclear weapons in Japan and South Korea. And that is not in anybody's interest. So it, it has a yeah. lot of negative effects, really, on the security of the region overall. This is the Voice of Russia broadcasting from the heart of London. From Monday to Friday, we're live here on digital from 4 p.m. until 8. We're also online at ruvr.co.uk. Tune in for current affairs, news, arts and debate. I want to remind our listeners that you're listening to Debating Russia here on Voice of Russia. As Andre pointed out, I mean, we have the American pivot to the Pacific, so this is making it even more complicated here. Let, let's, let's talk about some scenarios here. I mean, Aiden, if I can go to you, let's say North Korea collapses, you know, you know flesh that out a little bit. What does that mean? Gosh, there are many variants, and uh, I, I have spent 40 years being wrong about North Korea. I think I'm probably wrong again. Uh, I spent most of those as a collapse. Uh, has anybody been right about Korea? Uh, has, it's, uh, has, anyone, has anyone been right about North it's, Korea? It's pretty I, difficult. They are I'm good letting at, you off the hook. <laughs> they are good at wrong-footing us, but what, what I thought was... I, Having been a Marxist in my youth, uh, as, as was your country, I suppose I could say. All, um, all I, of us were. <laughs> I thought that the contradictions, both internal and external, use a good Maoist term, were so acute. They, 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 they threaten us so much, the outside world. No, they're never, <laughs> never on the scale that they're doing now, verbally at least. And they also squeeze their own people so hard, you know, would, would they ever rebel that one way or the other, I thought the system would break down. But I was probably too influenced by the what happened in Eastern Europe in a somewhat different way in the former Soviet Union. Mm. Uh, and I think whatever happens, it would probably be, be much messier than that. Um, it, it, there could be all kinds of scenarios, and I think the, the Americans and South Koreans have planning for them. The Chinese have a separate set of plans, maybe the Russians do too. I hope all these people are secretly coordinating, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure whether they are. Well, I mean, they, they, there are so many people <laughs> under arms. The South Koreans might be worried that, uh, that there's you know, you know, 900,000 people coming down south looking for action, basically. Um, the people are so poor and so desperate they're really at the at or the edge of hunger so both the the f stream of refugees that might go into china and into south korea is one of the the, the big problems for both of those countries Andre, uh, let's talk about the libyan example because because uh, i think it's kind of important because you see Gaddafi essentially well he did he gave up any kind of nuclear ambitions weapons of mass destruction he was quite transparent and then we had the the uprising in his and he was um deposed um, through NATO force, we have to keep in mind here. How much do you think the, the North Koreans look at that example? I mean, if they were to say, look, you know, we'll give up all this, you give us this food, you give us this technology, we'll be transparent, we'll rejoin the, uh, um, the non-proliferation treaty, let's say all of those things here. But then they look at what happened to Gaddafi. 
How do you much do you think that influences them? Well, they definitely are looking at Gaddafi. They are definitely looking at other cases when uh, I, I guess there is a sort of this um, understanding that all this thing of Arab Spring was somehow imposed by the United States to overthrow uh, some well, of the regions they don't like. quite laughable. Oh, oh, yeah, really? of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, 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 but still, there is that narrative, and I, I guess that the, um, Kim Jong-un is probably really um, following that really closely. Well, no, historically speaking, I mean, you give up your weapons and then you get overthrown. I mean, that's one way you can look at what happened in Libya. Okay? There are other ways, but that's one way. Sort of. Yes, but again, for example, if you look, uh, uh, there is no real evidence that uh, in the last say couple of decades that someone was uh, using its weapons of mass destruction while having a sort of internal conflict. The last one was probably the uh, Saddam Hussein uh, with Kurds, uh, but it wasn't really a civil war, it was more the special operations. And if you come back to, for example, the Syrian scenario, which are having the civil war for two years already and still going on, uh, Syrian regime did not use its chemical weapons they could, they have this opportunity, and uh, it means that you, st- you, you do have the weapons of mass destruction, but you don't use them. That's one of the problems with weapons of mass destruction, because it's, mm-hmm. the, it's too high of a price you would pay in case you would try to use them. Well, no, you essentially no, 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 risk didn't regime stop change. The of well, the well, you, you, yeah, well, that's a very good yeah, point. We didn't have a civil war in the Soviet Union. Um, that was okay, a really Aiden, good Aiden, and Christo, can you, sp- can you speak to this, what I'm talking about with Libya? I mean, I, I don't know if Ung is even, you know, how cognizant he is of the outside world. I have no idea. I guess none of us know. But, I mean, would he, would his regime be looking at what happened in Libya and say this is not the path to take? Oh, yeah, Andre is entirely correct about this, and you can cite uh, articles from the North Korean press, which uh, hopefully Kim Jong-un, who has outside education as well as an internal one, would know. I would go further than that. I mean, mm-hmm. I did write one article in the Financial Times trying, <laughs> people may be surprised to see things from the viewpoint of Pyongyang. Uh, remember Axis of Evil, anybody? I mean, we know now it was just one ambitious young speechwriter. Oh, yeah. They had two which were Muslim, and uh, get us a non-Muslim, so North Korea fits the bill very well. If, if you see it from Pyongyang... <laughs> <laughs> the first one is invaded and regime change and the leader is executed. Iran, there is still constant talk of invasion as one option on the table. And then, yes, he was directly at Condoleezza Rice and others in that period urged him to follow the example of that very sensible chap, Colonel Gaddafi. Um, seen from where they are, they see it basically like the National Rifle Association in America sees ownership of guns. You're not safe. The bad guys have got this stuff. And you're not safe unless you've got one. They see themselves as a good guy. We, we might beg to differ. Yeah. Most of us think that a country that is bristling with guns in there, well, the Swiss manage, though, don't they? So anyway, maybe I shouldn't generalize like that. But that's how they see it. Not, they, I think they have made their regime in that sense impregnable, maybe not in all senses. Yes, I think they're wrong about that. Because Great, Christoph, they used the nuclear program, the North Korean... Go ahead, go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, I was just going to say, I don't think the nuclear program is going to save them, nor, is, nor are they that vulnerable without a nuclear program, because the United States will not attack them even if they only have conventional forces. And the Libyans didn't have nuclear weapons, they only had a nuclear program. I'd like to ask all three of you, Aiden, they used their nuclear program as a bargaining chip in the past. Is, is that scenario over with now? Yeah, they say it's over. They say that, I think they've written it into law now. They say we are a nuclear power. Of course, it means they lied through their teeth for years, saying it was all for peaceful purposes and so on. Um, but this is a real difficulty. Of course, they can't formally be accepted as a nuclear power, but equally, there's probably not a great deal anybody can do about it. They might be willing to make a bargain about future developments. If they could say they, they keep some of their nuclear facilities and then they promise not to develop any further, they might be willing to enter a kind of dual track kind of negotiations that looks at that. Yeah, last yes, word. I would uh, consent to that just because, for example, they are talking at the moment of opening new facilities and reopening the free, frozen ones so they can just bargain with that, not expanding the program. Fascinating discussion, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Christoph, Aiden, and Andre here in Moscow with me. You've been listening to Debating Russia here on Voice of Russia. Stay with us.